All right. We were trying to figure out how many people we can fit on one stage. So there you are. <laughs> this, is, this is probably the maximum. Um, fantastic. That was, that was a great session. Uh, I think this is going to be greater. Uh, but let's, <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go for it. But before I get started, I would love for all of you uh, to just quickly introduce yourself, maybe name, rank, serial number, um, and then, and then we, go from, we go from there. And, uh, maybe we start with you, Rahul. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm Rahul Patel. Uh, work for KBC Bank, uh, responsible for USA Business Chief Information Officer and Chief Innovation Officer. Uh, I've been with KBC more than 20 years. Yeah, that's pretty much. And we'll talk more Good. later. Uh, Rohan Randiwe, uh, work for US Bank. Uh, just moved there after 16 years with uh, BB&T and Truist. Uh, head of third party management at US Bank. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Chris McConaughey, CFO of National Grid here in New York. We own and operate um, a portion of the electricity and gas network here in, in New York and operate about uh, $18 billion of assets and serve around 7 million customers here in the Northeast. Um, I'm Jen Cohen. I'm CEO of Lights On Advantage, a firm I started about a year ago. And prior to that, I was CIO for Toyota Research Institute. Good morning, I'm Shankar Krishnamurthy. I'm head of uh, essential tech and innovation at uh, S&P Global. S&P Global is a, you know, uh, is, a, is a financial services company that uh, is into, of course, you know it mostly through our S&P Global rate, the index, but we also provide uh, a lot of data services and we are one, you know, one of the companies that uh, is fundamentally reshaping the data services market. Um, <clears throat> Samir Shah is with Chubb Insurance. Um, global finance operations, which includes, you know, obviously financial services, transformation, strategic initiatives for the company. Uh, before Chubb, I was partner in Deloitte Consulting. So when Sandeep said, was talking about people who sit in conference rooms, I took it very personally. <laughs> uh, but I think I'm one of those people who actually made the transition from conference rooms to being closer now in my current role to the carols of the world. Sandeep Sisheri, part of World Discluver, responsible for converting data into internal insights as well as embedding into our operations across the board and building new solutions for our customers. Yeah. Fantastic. And by the way, Rohan, Rohan, besides being a banker, is also a rapper. He's, yeah. he's yep. <laughs> if, if, if you guys haven't uh, heard his, his, um, his rap, which he created on ChatGPT yesterday, I became a rapper overnight. <laughs> rapper overnight. <laughs> In so, actually an hour while I was walking the halls listening to a call. <laughs> and that's... That's a different story. I, <laughs> I was I was trying to get get our venue to play that rap uh, as as all of us were walking onto the stage, but I guess we've not figured out the IP violations with ChatGPT yet so <laughs> to 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 figure all that out. But let's let's get started. I, and I think um, I wanted to get started with this digital dichotomy. And some of you were here yesterday, some of you weren't. Um, but I think there this is what's happening in today's world. On one hand. There is a macroeconomic slowdown, right? Um, uh, every month we look at uh, how fast the GDP is growing. Is it one percent plus or minus one percent? And we are we are at the borderline, right? Uh, inflation is still uh, going on. Supply chain disruptions, uh, cybersecurity. There's a war going on right now in the world. There's just so much, right? And our research suggests that if you take tech spending or IT spending. Uh, that's shrinking. You know, operational budgets are shrinking. Uh, talent crunch is not going away. So there's a macroeconomic slowdown. But at the same time, there's a big hurry to innovate. You know, everybody wants to do things as of yesterday. Uh, you know, digital is no longer some sci-fi that's going to happen in three or four years. It's essential for survival right here, right now. Uh, you know, uh, Sandeep gave us a great example of how industry lines are blurring, how ecosystems are being created, right? Who would have imagined USG partnering with Walmart? Uh, right to to create new sources of value. So, so, and both these things are true at the same time. Right, you have the slowdown and a big hurry <laughs> happening happening together. So there's a there's a huge component of how do you achieve a lot more with a lot less. Uh, that's that's going on, and I I think that's one of the themes for for this panel is how do you balance your priorities and and investments. But before I go on, I know it's second day, so I wanted to get you guys engaged a little bit. So if you go on, on your, on your uh, 
phones and, and try and answer this question. What, what is your organization's big priority in today's context? Is it bottom line impact? Is it top line impact? Uh, is it you know, driving better business outcomes? Um, is it making progress on ESG? Uh, is it improving company valuation or is it all of the above at the same time? That's interesting. It's all of, a, it's all of the above. <laughs> there is no priority and everything is a priority, right? Um, so it's, it's sort of all of the above and, and driving growth, right? I, I think that's where, that's where this, this market is headed. So if we go back to the if we go back to the slide deck, so this is this is very telling, right? And and we'll we'll start to discuss this. If we go back to the slide deck, please. If we can. Oh, there we are. So I I wanted to I wanted to start with this, right? And and I think I think um, when we at HFS look at the enterprise innovation framework, I think digital is now horizon one. We, we are not saying digital is something that's going to happen in five years. It's, it's, you, you cannot survive without digital. But I think what the digital narrative has done is it's, it's kept technology at the center, but we've forgotten a little bit about the people and the processes and the data and the culture, right? And I think that's what Horizon 2 here, one office is, where you bring all these value creation levers to find, find value. And Horizon 3 is one ecosystem. And, and as I mentioned, UHG partnering with Walmart, you know, all you guys will be partnering with, you know, industry lines are blurring. Um, and, and that's one ecosystem. If you have to find new sources of value, you've got to create uh, partnerships, you know, you've got to bring people together. So I would love to start with you, maybe Jen, I'll start with you, you know, what is, what, what are you seeing as the biggest priority in, in today's context, right, where, where you have this slowdown and the big hurry to innovate? Yeah, I, th I think when I think about um, the big hurry to innovate, I think about the fact that restaurants that make it don't have the same menu for 25, 50 years, right? Um, I used to work for Toyota. They started as a loom company. Most people don't know that. They didn't start as a car company. We know that Fortune 500s, people last less and less time. So I think innovation is key to staying on that index, to continuing to profit. I do think our challenge is that we get really excited about the ideation part of innovation, and I don't think we're quite as strong uh, on the uh, other parts of it, the adoption, the change management. To, to innovate, it has to be adopted. And so having spent five years at a research institute, I've really honed in on how important that is. And I think it is hard to balance that when you're trying to cut costs, but there is, you know, there are, we've all done it, there are ways to, but I think we've got to really hone in on the, the less fun side away from the ideation into how do we actually use what we've ideated. Yeah, so Chris, you are a, you are a CFO. Do you keep pushing your organization on the left? You know, there's a slowdown happening, man. Cut costs, or how do you how do you balance these priorities? I uh, I sometimes uh, I sometimes joke internally that I think my guilty pleasure is within the HR function, and that's where kind of a lot <laughs> of my thought process sits. But I, mm -hmm. um, you know, like any CFO in any enterprise, highly focused on you know cost containment, particularly in a in an inflationary environment that we've seen, and particularly with the supply chain disruption. Uh, that we continue to see and it's forever changing. Um, similar to some of Sandeep's comments, um, and this may be a bit strange coming from a CFO, but a lot of our priorities are actually going back to basics within our organization. Um, you know, I, I could probably get a show of hands of how many organizations in the room have been focused on defining their purpose and spending time on ESG goals. Uh, but ultimately we're spending a lot more time um, building enterprise leadership within the organization. So 19,000 people in the US. Um, we often have programs at National Grid like any organization that we roll things out and they impact everybody, but only 500 people understand what they are and what purpose they have. So we've spent a lot of time on culture and understanding deep in the business, particularly with our field crews on, do they understand how, they, how we make money? Do they know how to optimize the work they do? And do they know how to solve for some of the challenges in front of them? So. You know, similar to what Sandeep said, it's a lot about, you know, finding our carol and making sure that, you know, we're not just defining purpose and we're not just trying to solve for purpose, but we're understanding some of those key blockers and inhibitors for why we can't excel around our purpose. And that actually comes deep within the field force, particularly to regulated utility. Yeah, that's fantastic. So it's finding your carol. Samir, you're a, you're a part of a shared service, right? And shared services are 
known for cost containment, right? Is 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 that the priority now, or is it broader? I mean, I, I'd say that's frankly table stakes, right? That's just part of how you run, you know, like so I have global finance operations, right, kind of beyond shared services. But, you know, interestingly, the, the journey we've taken is, so when I was a consultant, right, I was kind of looking at your slide here, right, we also always, I personally also advise clients, right, you do foundational stuff, then you do value add stuff. So the minute I had the opportunity to, to be in a role where I could actually directly own the change, I did the exact opposite, right? I didn't take my own advice. And we actually started with things which added value, even if the back end was you know, broken, et cetera, right? So a bit aligned to what Sandeep was saying, right? Um, what ultimately helped our business, helped you know, the people we write insurance for, people out in the front lines, um, that's actually where we started. Um, yeah, the cost containment, et cetera, right? And, you know, I was looking at the, the poll, right? I mean, frankly, all that is table stakes too, right? If, I mean, if you are the leader of any sized organization, you should be doing all of those things mm. at the same time, right? And if you're not, you're failing in your duties as a leader. Um, so, but that's the journey we've actually been on, so in kind of reverse order. Impact, uh, value, and then kind of, you know, picking up the more foundational stuff as we could, as, you know, budgets, et cetera, uh, allowed. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Cost containment is, is hygiene, yeah. pretty much, right? It's, yeah. it's, like, it's like payroll, right? You don't, if you get your payslip, you don't call your payroll, hey, thank you for my payslip, it's just <laughs> assumed. Um, and sort of if I can add to what, uh, you know, what the panelists said, I don't, you know, even think of this as a dichotomy. In fact, you know, innovation probably also helps in terms of cost optimization. Right, so you don't necessarily look at this as a, because I'm innovating, I'm you know, forced to optimize elsewhere or the other way around. I think they go in hand in hand. Uh, innovation is usually seen as something that generates new business opportunities, business value. But innovation also could be applied to you know, taking over costs and making your operations more efficient, which in turn you know, provides you know, further dollars for you to invest into growth opportunities. So I think it's important to look at you know, innovation is not necessarily only a growth driver, but also as a you know as a cost optimal right oh, that's a fantastic point and uh, uh, rohan if i could if i could bring you in right besides writing rap you're also a, <laughs> uh, you're also a risk uh, professional right uh, and and we saw yesterday when phil was presenting cybersecurity is the number one concern right now right what is what is your priority in your so, organization so i think uh, I, I as as chris said right with, Going back back to the to the basics, right? But but at the at the end of the day, how do you create a very balanced portfolio? It's all about portfolio management, right? You've got to you've got to do your your run your operations or run your business. You've got to optimize your business, and then you've got to have your innovate or transform your business. You've got to figure out what is the right way in which you you want to invest across the portfolio. You can't over invest in one because that, that is gonna not, not get you where, you where you want, right? The run the business and optimize the business is as important as, as you wanna innovate. So it just depends on the type of business and the company you're in that allows you to do that. And then it has to be, there have to be foundational components. Cybersecurity is a foundational component. Risk management is a, is a foundational component. Good business continuity and DR practices have now become foundational components. So if, if you can build the foundation and then you can figure out how to balance or rebalance your portfolio, that's, that's a, a, a recipe for, for success. No, that's fantastic. So, so let me uh, ask you this, Sandeep, uh, is you know, we heard a lot about data right, uh, uh -huh. yesterday, and thankfully so. <laughs> um, and, but do these current conditions, you know, is, and we've been talking about data forever, right? At yes. least uh, ever since I've been a, a grown-up person, um, and it continues to be, you know, we don't have data, and we don't have quality data, we don't have consistent data, and, you know, velocity and all kinds of adjectives are thrown at it. Uh, and my sense is there's never been a burning platform to do this, right? People react to things, people don't just do things. And, and do you think the, today's economic conditions creates that burning platform for enterprises to actually do something? Uh, and and drive that data-driven decision-making? The answer, uh, this is a great question, and I would say the answer is yes and no. Uh, you That's know, yes, diplomatic. But uh, yes. <laughs> today's conditions are unique, but three years ago we had the pandemic, and that was unique too, and previously we had the, the, the Great Recession, that was unique too. So each one of these conditions 
has existed almost every year. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so in some sense, it goes back to focusing on the customer. If you really understand your customer and are close to the customer, mm -hmm. the customer tells you kind of what they are experiencing today. And our customers are experiencing unusual amount of pain today. The speed at which that they are needing to move to serve their customers, because we are a B2B company. 80% of our revenue is subscription revenue. So that gives us a lot of leeway in thinking about the long term rather than the short term. But if you travel with the customer, they're taking us to new places. So I'll give you one example. There's a product that we provided for our customers and as the market leader for decades now. And a historical uh, uh, cycle time and quality associated with that was 30 hours. Hmm. They've been very happy with it. The conditions changed for a certain number of our customers and they said, well, we'd like it the same day. So rather than listening to the customer just on the surface, what we did was we probed with those customers, sat with them and said, what exactly is the challenge that you're facing? Are you facing compliance issues and financial obligations that are changing because of the regulations? If that's what your need is, let's create a new product for you. An outcome of that was that now instead of 30 hours, we provide a, a completely customized outcome in less than 40 minutes. Now that's transformational. Now, this is the challenge of listening properly. Right? You listen to one customer, you think sometimes you're solving one customer's problem, but typically speaking, if you actually start talking to other customers, there are many, many, many more. So segmentation, understanding of, is this a unique one-off thing or is this a comprehensive market-based approach? So that's the balance of innovation. Hmm. And you're right. So in some sense, we do need to speed up and we do need to think about a scale that's completely different. But today's technologies allow us to do that. So it's a man-machine combination. It's not just machine itself can do these things. You do have to have good listening force so that when the customer has that pain, you're able to translate that quickly. So that's what we are finding, that this is ecosystem. Our customers are raising their voices a lot more. So let's listen more carefully. No. Rahul, if I could if I could ask you the same question as a CIO, right? Is is the CIO the CDO as well, or where where does who's responsible for data? Who's responsible for 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 data for driving yeah. data driven okay. decision? So it has to be the partnership. You cannot in a bigger organization just shift the responsibility. Yes, one person or the one department has to have the accountability, but at the end uh, we have to collaborate. So I think it's a shared responsibility because again, data, the, the key aspect for many organizations, data drives the business, uh, data, uh, you know, the uh, data provides or the, gives the better customer experience. And uh, so now collectively that has to be, uh, responsibility has to be taken. And that's how we would operate. So partnership. Yes. Shankar, you are in the data business, right? In a, in a way, right? How, how does your organization drive decision-making using using data? So data, you know, I think this is a often repeated word, right? People say, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new gold, it's, you know, it's a new oil, whatever, right? But, you know, for fundamentally data is an enterprise asset. That's the way we look at it. So we look at uh, data as an enterprise asset as a, you know, as a, as a, a foundational element of, you know, how we approach data. And we also look at data and technology to be almost symbiotic because one uh, cannot, cannot uh, be effective without the other. So there's, a, there's a, a, a lot of focus on trying to you know, figure out how technology can improve uh, the, the volume of data that we deal with, the, uh, the, the quality of data that we share, you know, share with the customers. Ultimately, uh, you know, you can, you know, uh, going back to what he said, you know, it's not one person's responsibility. Yes, there's a data ownership. Uh, for a particular set of data, somebody has to be an owner. But in, in order to make the whole ecosystem work together, you need to have technology and data, work, you know, working in, in concert. And uh, there's, there's a lot of effort we have, you know, put in uh, towards this. In fact, there's a significant uh, transformation project right now in uh, how we uh, source data, how we, uh, how we uh, pipeline the data, and how we, you know, uh, let our customers consume the data. So the end-to-end -end pipeline is something that we are streamlining, primarily using, the, you know, technologies, including some of them, 
uh, you know, technologies which are uh, fairly new, and some of them have been around for a while. But the bottom line is, like, you know, you want to increase the velocity of the data that's flowing through the pipelines to the customer. You want to make sure it's accurate and, uh, and, it, and it's of high quality. At the end of the day, our customers, you know, come to us because of the trust they have in our brand and the quality of the data we share with them. So it's extremely important for us to make sure that that is never compromised in the, you know, in the, in the uh, urgency to deliver the data. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So, sir, well, I'll just add one. The most important role these days is that of a data janitor. I think we defined that a couple of, couple of years ago, but I don't think the role ever picked up. I think it's, but I think it's not to get data right. You have to constantly keep working, working at it. It's not going to get clean by itself. It'll never. That's just an aspiration. How do you set up the protocols and the governance and we, we joke about it, data janitors, but that's the job. You, you need to have that, those governance mechanisms in the police to really make sure that the data is, is clean to be able to do anything with it. Yeah, and, and, and I love the data janitor, right? It should be, but I've not seen a LinkedIn post on data janitorial <laughs> jobs yet. HR uh, will not allow <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, But Chris, I think if I could ask you, right, finance gets all the data. Right? Uh, at the end of the day, everything should come to finance, right? So shouldn't finance be the owner of data in a way? Or, uh, th there's been conversation around, you know, can finance drive enterprise performance planning, for example, right? EPM, etc. cetera. I, I would agree. If I could call myself the finance janitor, then yes, I'd have to. <laughs> um, I would say yes, but not dissimilar to any other function. I, I think we, we sometimes put <clears throat> current... I'd say commercial problems into functional silos instead of trying to uh, make sure we talk about them in terms of capabilities. So it's not whether legal should own it, it's not whether finance should own it, it's not whether it should be the CIO's office, it's what capabilities do you need to support the data that supports your customer base, that helps you deliver to your purpose. And I think you know it's no different uh, 30 years ago when I think about, you know, how I used to collect passwords for online systems. If I tried to operate the same method I used 30 years ago to keep my Hotmail password in an environment where I've got about 35 passwords in the UK, about the same in the US on the same platforms, I'm gonna fail. And I think organizations often try and take new themes and put them into boxes around how you used to do them or into functional silos. So I, I think we've got to get away from the concept of functions and start hmm. thinking about what capabilities do you need to support your organization and then put functions around those capabilities? Yeah, that's that's fantastic. That's basically our definition of one office, right? So you've, you've just articulated that, so thank you. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask about your sleeping patterns now a little bit, right? Is there's just so much happening, right? There's cybersecurity concerns, supply chain, inflation, consumers are changing their behaviors irrespective of whichever industry you belong to, it's just, hard to find quality people and then harder to retain them. Uh, you know, regulations and compliance are not going away. In fact, they're, uh, you know, we're, as I mentioned, the R word keeps, uh, you know, getting thrown at us. Uh, ESG, climate change, DEI, you know, <laughs> keep keep going at it. What, what keeps you awake? And maybe I'll ask all of you, you know, maybe I'll start with you, Sandeep. Uh, what keeps you awake at night and what are you doing to sleep better. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I sleep quite nicely. Because if you don't sleep well, you can't solve any of these problems. <laughs> uh, sleepless people are not useful people. So please do sleep well. Uh, I'd say that, uh, again, it goes back to start with the outcome. What outcomes are you trying to be relied upon for your, by your customers? And if your customers are expecting certain level of efficacy from a, a security, cybersecurity perspective, because you're providing them SaaS solutions which are mission critical for the, your customers. That is priority one. If your customers are expecting that you are going to help them meet their obligations on regulations, figure out that you are going to stay on top of that from both the technology point of view but an understanding point of view. So how do you bring data scientists and regulation experts in together so that they can digest all of that massive amounts of change that's happening in the world and convert that into useful, usable outcomes for the customer. So I think it's not about 
sleep or not sleep. It's about really understanding the needs of your customers mm -hmm. and exactly what is your reasons for existence. So that's what we have tried to focus on. Obviously, the basics of cybersecurity, cyber ch uh, supply chain disruptions, all these things we have experienced over the last few years now, that they have to have been elevated across every single corporation. Yep. We've certainly gone through that maturation process. So now the game is, now what next? Again, it goes back to the customer. Solve the pain of the customer and the rest is table stakes. Fantastic. Samir, are you sleeping well? Yeah, yeah, generally, <laughs> yes. Um, and very little, but that's just a bad habit. <laughs> right. um, no, I would, I would agree, right? Um, I think, you know, staying close to the market, right? Ultimately, helping our, or, you know, parts of the organization which are dealing with the end customers, right? Kind of our top line, you know, growth uh, goals. How can we support them, right? I think that's key. Um, we are, you know, a very global company. We operate in 50 odd countries and we are also a very federated model, right? So it's all about, and you know, when you think about selling insurance, of course, you know, a big part of the business is selling to other big companies, multinationals, but a big part of the business is also retail, right? We are selling life insurance in Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, Australia, et cetera. We are selling, you know, retail. Many of you might be Chubb Insurance customers. Um, and the way the business works in different countries, different markets is very different, right? In Indonesia, people are buying insurance through WhatsApp, right? Making payments through WhatsApp. Oh. Here, we don't do that, right? So I think we, as leaders, particularly sitting in New York and London, always have to kind of guard against arrogance that we can kind of speak for the local markets. So, you know, just adding on to your point about listening, kind of listening in the right places, being mm -hmm. close to where the action actually is. Um, I think that's key. Uh, and then when I look at this list, frankly, if there's anything on here, I'd say I'd highlight the quality of people. Mm. I think that's something I've really become sensitized to over the last couple of years, having the right people in the right roles. I mean, of course, you know, it's kind of management 101, but on a practical level, I think if you have that addressed, I think the rest, the rest can be taken care of with that team. Shankar? So I would say two things, right? One is, uh, I mean, of course, there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, <coughs> concerns listed here. But I think the two things that probably are top of the mind for us, one is obviously, uh, you know, protecting our reputation and our brand. And uh, it falls into probably the cybersecurity, you know, making sure like, you know, our brand is not compromised by any, any of these uh, cyber issues. And that's where I think the generative AI adds another level of complexity to this because, you know, you're worried about, you know, bias in the AI and, you know, whole other, whole other uh, dimensions that could potentially impact your brand. So I would say the, the one that probably keeps us, you know, awake at night is how do we ensure, you know, we, we protect our brand and the reputation that comes along with it. The second thing is, you know, this is probably a bit of a outcome of the, uh, the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, you know, we as a company, we uh, have built a very strong culture of innovation and that's primarily driven from a people first culture. And to a large extent that got, uh, I would say solidified by people working together in the office, uh, having moved to a hybrid model. So we do worry about, you know, how do we ensure that this culture of innovation, culture of collaboration doesn't get lost, right? And that's very critical for us as we, you know, uh, as we look at uh, in our future, how do we ensure that people stay engaged and the people stay connected to the company and the culture of something that we have created over the years is something that's going to be sustained. Yeah, uh, culture and uh, cybersecurity. Yeah. And Jen, what are you hearing from clients? Um, you know, when I work with customers, I'm hearing kind of the same themes over and over, and it comes down uh, to skipping steps. So we're always looking to put in new technology. There's always the next thing. This, this time it's generative AI. Next year it'll be something different. And so we're always rapidly trying to put things in. But I also watch companies skipping those key steps. We heard a little bit about it yesterday. Change management. You know, we talked, to, we talked about data and cyber. Uh, a tiny bit of effort up front on data, on cyber, on accessibility before you build. Those things really rapidly accelerate. We're towards that 100 times. Uh, we saw earlier, so I'm constantly thinking of how do we, uh, because it's human nature to skip steps, I do it too, you know, yes. uh, you know <laughs> how do we get better about that so that that acceleration is, is moving and so that those innovations are getting to the users and getting adopted faster. That's the first. And the second is a little more personal, but there are a lot of uh, women tech leaders leaving the industry, and I'm really worried about what that does in relation to group think and different ideas and how do we be innovative when we don't have all the voices we had before. So those are the two things that are keeping me up at night uh, here and there. So. 
No, it's uh, that is especially the the women leaders leaving tech. Uh, you, you know, for if you think logically, it should be the other way around, right? But uh, in reality, it's going uh, in a different direction, yeah. which I I don't comprehend to be honest. Uh, Chris, what's are you sleeping well? <laughs> Th thank you to the panel as well. I think I've got uh, more things that are going to keep me awake tonight. So I'll, <laughs> I'll be going to bed at seven o'clock. Um, I'd say there's one thing for me. Um, it's people. Um, and I say that because, you know, in the first, I'd say, phase of my career, I was generally very distinct between corporate and private life. And I think over the past three, four years, both enterprise and people, we've blurred the lines between those things and actually they're one of the same thing. So people's private lives and also what they do in the commercial environment and what companies need to do across society in the commercial space are one of the same thing. And I think if you can... Um, understand that and, and build processes to support it, you'll be in a good spot. But I think one of the things that does keep me up at night in the context of that is just ensuring that out of all the table stakes items that we've talked about, so when we think about cost discipline, when we think about risk management, those are things we're just expected to do. But the one kind of, I'd say, overarching theme is do you have the right people with the right development, with the right purpose, doing the right things in your organization? And and I think as leaders and leaders in this room, you know, the profound impact we have on not just the people that work for us, but the second and third degrees of separation that the choices they make in their lives. And I think if you can get the right people and you can support them the right way, you can do all of these other things at scale and you can do them at 100x. So I'd say it's definitely people first and first order of priority. Yeah, and, and I think the, the other angle that you mentioned was the work-life balance, right? Especially in today's hybrid world. And we had a great panel on talent yesterday where, where we sort of uh, peeled, peeled a little bit because hybrid work isn't just, you know, giving people a Zoom and a team license and then saying hybrid work, this is hybrid work, right? It's just, I don't think it's settled uh, yet. Rohan, what's, what's keeping you away? I, I, I believe the chance favors the prepared mind. Right, so if you think through the pandemic, how quickly everyone came together, and uh, providers, uh, clients, everyone came together to solve a problem, and we innovated. Nobody ever had BCP plans in a global pandemic that they could just pull off the shelf and say, "Here's." Right. But we shouldn't rest on our laurels, right? I think we've got to continuously plan, anticipate, and most importantly, invest in the relationships today. So that whenever there is an event of that nature or any, any events that really cause massive disruptions, we should be able to work in partnerships. But it's the, it's the people and the relationship aspects that's going to make, the, make, it, make it most count. And Rahul, last but not the least, what's, yeah. what's keeping you awake? <laughs> Lately, I've been sleeping okay, <laughs> uh, but not in the past. Uh, at times, I did stay awake, uh, I have to confess. Um, and it has to be cybersecurity, not uh, uh, to increase the customer experience or bringing up innovation, innovative solution. No, it's cybersecurity. Uh, why? Um, you know, it's, this war is not fair. You know, all hackers need one weakness to exploit, whereas we have to fix all weaknesses. So it's not a fair game. But again, that's what it is, is um, ever changing the threat landscape again that's not fair um, with all this innovation and then uh, bringing the better customer experience you have to introduce new technologies um, you have to uh, embrace vendors but that creates uh, exposure and uh, distance to the you don't have direct control over them sometimes um, also, you have to adopt cloud, and cloud adoption is the way to go, but also it creates this pressure. Uh, and all this, you know, uh, increases the cybersecurity risk, so one has to be concerned about. Of course, you have to find a way. Uh, so how do I sleep better? I take sleeping pills? No. <laughs> I, hate, uh, I eat ashwagandha. Is Ayurvedic uh, <laughs> medicine. No, joke aside, uh, you know, I have to go back to the fundamentals. Fix the fundamentals. Uh, you know, it's not like you are going to bring one solution and I'll, I'll start sleeping better. No. So you have to step back, again, see the fundamentals. What are your policies and procedures? The governance aspect. Uh, do we have the policies and procedures uh, really sharp? 
are we following policies and procedures, not to just please the regulators and just create the documentation to show to the regulators or auditors, but are we really uh, fo following the spirit? Uh, so that we need to uh, go back to the governance aspect and fix that one. Then the second aspect, which is, I know the crowd is not more cybersecurity aligned crowd maybe, and again, no fault of yours, but one fundamental aspect of cybersecurity to fix it is the CMDB. Unless you don't know what you have, you cannot protect. And most of the organization, they miss that part. They will bring many vendors and create the DLP solution and this uh, scanners they will bring and everything but they miss the part of the CMDB. The CMDB in a traditional sense, it captures the software and hardware. But I would extend that to in, uh, include the people and processes and the impact of those processes in that CMDB. And then, then you incorporate your CMDB with your all processes, meaning, and also you, you, you move away from your mindset of solution, uh, you know, um, oriented uh, cybersecurity program and make it more process oriented and then, then tie up very closely coupled with CMDB and then make sure that you are following your processes. So again, once I go back and once we go back to fundamentals, you start sleeping better. You don't need ashwagandha, you don't need the sleeping pills. <laughs> no, that's, that's fantastic and I think cybersecurity came up as the number one concern even on our uh, research and if you you're absolutely right. It's not a fair game, right? And if you look at what's happening, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about generative AI and, and other technologies. We've not talked about quantum computing in, in, uh, since yesterday. Uh, but imagine if a quantum computer goes, you know, in, in some bad hands and it's possible. Uh, it can break through your RSA, right? And I don't know how many enterprises are uh, designing quantum safe uh, cloud implementations, for example, right? Uh, it's, and it's, it's possible, right? Uh, and and uh, so th this is not a fair game, absolutely. And uh, I think it's a good thing to be awake uh, than just sleep over it. So, so I think that's fair. But, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit, we've talked a lot about the challenges, right? And let's, let's talk about some things that you're passionately driving uh, maybe I'll, I'll uh, start with you, Shankar. Right? Uh, I know you are you are trying to use ChatGPT to write some research, uh, uh, but but talk about some, you know that. And these could be people, process, tech, data, change, all of the above uh, kind of initiatives. But talk talk about sure. an initiative that you are doing, which you you feel passionate about. Yeah. So what are, what are the things that you know we are very passionate about uh, at SMP is we want everyone to be an innovator. There's an opportunity for every one of our 30,000 plus employees to be an innovator. So in order to enable that, we want to make sure we give them the uh, the, uh, the the culture to fail forward if you know and, and learn from it and move on. Don't don't be afraid of failures. They right? create the culture of uh, innovation. The second thing is we want to provide platforms that allows people to do innovation at scale. Right. So when you are talking about you know trying to get 30,000 people. Uh, uh, doing innovation, we need to have a, a process that can scale and a process that can, that can incentivize, recognize and support uh, this, support the innovators. So there is a, there is a significant, uh, uh, what, what you call the citizen-led innovation effort that we are driving and which has, brought, you know, which has been fairly significant, uh, seen some fairly significant results already. We, we have, uh, we, we did almost close about 20 hackathons last year. Uh, so it's almost like twice, you know, if you take, take 20 and you know it's annual you know if you look at it on a monthly basis about twice you know two hackathons a month right it's a fairly significant effort that our employees put in to come up with ideas and you know convert some of those ideas into potential showcases and potentially that lead into business opportunities as well so i think there's a there's a significant uh, opportunity we are seeing to to promote you know innovation as a culture across the company and you know our people are responding extremely well to the initiative and and that gives me a lot to go go by because this, i see the energy that's there in the uh, in the ecosystem, and that just makes us work harder to try and you know, keep that engagement going, and that's something I'm very passionate about. Fantastic, um, Sandeep. What's what are you driving these days? Uh, it's all about people. I, I love this, you know, Venn diagram of yours, and people is at the top, and investing in our people is the the greatest way to success. Um, if we can 
build on what uh, you were saying, Shankar, that uh, creating the spirit of innovation, culture of innovation, we are also trying to marry that with creating a culture of learning. Because we all have to educate ourselves in these new capabilities and new technologies and new emerging trends. So how do we ensure that our people have the capacity, the opportunity, and the ability to learn from each other and from external courses and otherwise? So it's a huge focus on that. And finally, there's this notion of breaking the boundaries. And I'll give you one instance of that. It's just a microcosm of an example. Data scientists talk a very different language. They go into that profession because they're often geeks. Yeah. Like me and you probably. We are introverts. We don't like to hang out with people. <laughs> we don't ask too many questions. We have surety on the mathematics of things, etc. The rest of the world doesn't connect with that. So part of it is forcing ourselves to be part of those ecosystems where those conversations are happening and where you can experience the front line. Part of it is also to recognize that you can't fundamentally change people. So how do you create the glue? The, the design thinkers, the process engineers, the translator roles, how do you bring them into the fold as well in the same ecosystem to allow them to leverage each other's strengths and create this comfort that when a propeller head comes into an operations team, they're actually going to be welcomed and expected to be part of that organization. So that's the, the, the culture part of it, that's the education part of it that is equally important as we drive innovation in the company. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, sir. I, I've got to ask all of you this, right? What is the technology that you're obsessed with right now? Uh, because <laughs> I, 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 I see there's a, there's almost like a East versus West divide uh, on technology. Mm -hmm. West Coast keeps coming up with a new technology every day and enterprises on the East Coast are still struggling with cloud, right? Which I first had my cloud conversation in 1996 or something, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, Metaverse was the flavor of the se season till three weeks back. Uh, it's chat GPT now for the last three weeks. Uh, who knows, uh, next three weeks there'll be something. So. Um, uh, Sameer, what's which technology excites you the most right now? I think you picked the right person to like, who's an East Coast representative of the yes. uh, <laughs> legacy industry. Um, but I think uh, you know part of it is probably there's an aspect of the ecosystem the East Coast and New York and Boston and all operate in. Um, um, you know, while California, you know, Northern California kind of operates in a different ecosystem, and I think part of it is a very practical problem of the kinds of companies which have a preponderance here, right? You have the banks, you have the insurance companies, you have the big pharma companies, legacy companies been around for hundreds of years, right? Um, where frankly, you know, light keeping lights on, basic stuff is so time consuming, right? Uh, requires so much attention. And then when you think about, you know, we're talking a lot about data, um, you know, we obviously have a lot of data, but we also have a lot of hard to get to data, mm. <laughs> right? So, you know, it's not as easy uh, for FSI in particular to, um, you know, kind of bring it to that layer, right? Where we're, you know, where a lot of these discussions happen, like, oh, I can extract it, I can use it, I can make it impact. Uh, because the the processes, the scale is so large. So, you know, what often happens in these kind of efforts, just to be able to get things done, you say, oh, well, let's bite off what we can chew, right? Let's do it small. But then that has a negative effect of it not being consequential, not being end-to-end -end enough to actually be sustainable, right? And kind of getting momentum and change behind it, right? And I think that's a little bit of a cash 22 problem, right? So, so basically any technology, as long as it creates some impact. <laughs> I think any, yeah. So, and, and that's the challenge in kind of applying it, right? And kind of like, I'm cannibalizing the phrase, the last mile phrase here, right? Kind of making an impact in a sustainable way becomes hard just because the opportunity is so big that by kind of trying to prove it in a subscale manner, we actually miss out the opportunity, you know, on the opportunity fair, fair and then point. something next comes along and yeah. then people are like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, you know, I did process automation and it saved me 
you know, few hundred jobs, but if I have a hundred thousand people, what does it matter? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so yeah. the, uh, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to jump in from the West Coast, because uh, I live in the land of driverless cars, uh, that I actually was really excited about ChatGPT, not because it's ChatGPT, but because it's more grounded in reality. Metaverse was hard for people to connect with. Metaverse was hard for people to see. And it's not that I think any one technology has the solution, but when, we're, when we are reimagining how we're going to do things, and it's something that people can touch and play with, uh, which they probably shouldn't be touching and playing with the driverless cars, right? I think it's uh, much more powerful and it allows us to move business forward because the resistance is much less. Yes, yeah, Pastor Chad GPT, Rohan. Taking the insights, the advice created by Chad GPT into actual actions in the metaverse to see the impact, to then see if those actions can be emulated in the real world. That's going to be the killer app. Hmm. Fantastic. AI plus metaverse. Generative AI plus metaverse. That's, that's great. Chris, what's exciting for you as a CFO? I would say for us, is I'm excited about a number of things on the slide, but analytics and applied AI. And I would also say um, the one thing I'm really keen on is making sure we can scale something. I often find with new technology, we keep giving an eight-year-old a new Ferrari that's never driven stick shift and giving them every six months and assuming they're going to do good things with it. And it's how do we deploy this technology in a way that you can actually scale and get enterprise value from it. Yeah. Rahul, what's exciting? Yeah, I think uh, I wouldn't give one or two names, but I think uh, AI family. And what do I mean by AI family, right? The generative uh, AI or the conversational AI, machine learning, uh, NLP. Uh, there are many use cases where you can combine together uh, with RPA technology. And that's where the hyper automation or intelligent automation would come and you can harness the power and then you can transform your business. Uh, so yeah, uh, and then also, uh, the cloud computing and the APIs uh, integration, that I would need that. And combining everything, probably you'll achieve so much efficiency, better customer experience, uh, reduce the human errors, and I think uh, it will make the world better if we use properly. Fantastic. Uh, the last question, we're out of time, but if you had one wish yeah. that could come true, what would it be? And Rahul, maybe we'll yeah. start with you. I, I hinted that uh, my wish <laughs> would be AI become mature, but also responsible. And that mm -hmm. would be the wish because it will make, and I'm making a sweeping statement, it will make the, uh, um, you know, the earth better. Uh, it will help humankind and, and everyone. If AI become mature now, with and also responsible. Mature and responsible AI. Fantastic. Rohan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Responsible AI leading to world peace. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> what about world hunger? <laughs> you, you, that too. You've got to solve for that too, mm -hmm. man. Uh, uh, Chris. Um, one for me is probably see if we can um, move away from global GDP being the anchor of performance around the world and, and oh, fantastic. put in place an alternative sustainable GDP measure. I think that would be fantastic because our accounting, the way that we measure success, it hasn't changed for ever, right? And, and I think uh, that's a fantastic point. Jen? Um, I think mine is the same as before. I really want us to learn the lesson so we can accelerate and get to that 100 times. Shankar? My, my, my wish would be if you know, we can make the uh, transition to the sustainable energy sources much faster than what we've been able to do so far. Samir? Um, I'd say the world waking up a bit more to climate change. Climate change. And Sandeep, last but not least? Customer listening at scale. Customer listening at scale. You want to be a super bro. <laughs> and, and converting that to outcomes. Because I think we all listen to customers. We, very few of us actually act. How many times have you gone to an airline and actually taken the survey? And you go to the next flight and do you see any change? No. None at all. Yeah. So I think we all listen, but we don't necessarily act do anything with it. Right? Yeah. So that's what yeah. I'm hoping that we No, say. fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank You've you. been a fantastic panel. Thank you for, for sharing your insights.